This will be about the gaming hardware market. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know us, one slide. Uh, John Bay Research, we uh, monitor, measure, <clears throat> and forecast uh, hardware and software markets that have anything to do with computer graphics, uh, which includes uh, gaming. And so we look at gaming from multiple platforms, and we're going to show you what we think are some of the numbers of these platforms, which I think is pretty impressive. The numbers are really, really large. And um, my cohort in crime here, Ted, <clears throat> uh, will, will be uh, discussing some of the things as well as a new category that we're really excited about. And we have some really, really terrific prizes for you. So given the uh, population of the, of the real press here, there's a good chance you're all going to walk out with something. Uh, this is just a little quick diagram. That was a quick diagram to uh, show what it is we do. Uh, we basically track the pixel and anything that influences the pixel, generates a pixel, modifies it. So we care all about the GPUs and the ISPs and we care about the software that drives those things, but we don't care about disk drives and, and internets and, and radios and things of that nature. So the agenda is that I'm going to give you a brief overview of the history of computer graphics, which I think, I hope you will anyway find interesting. Uh, then we'll discuss the individual platforms market size and growth, a little bit of speculation on the future, uh, then we'll award some prizes and we'll let you get back to uh, Microsoft. They'll be finished by then. So, the question is, uh, I don't know how many folks have been coming to uh, GDC for very long, but when do you think it started? Anybody want to throw in? 1988. What? 88. 88? That's a pretty good guess, but it's wrong, but it's right. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you why. So most people think it started in 97, and that's when uh, Crawford started GDC, actually the GDC World is what he called it originally, <clears throat> and that's the forefather of this show. But before that, there was a conference called PC Game Consortium, so your, your date was pretty good. Uh, PC Consortium was uh, designed to uh, develop standards within the gaming industry, and uh, one of the things they wanted to do was develop an API to try and stabilize the market at that time, it was pretty, pretty well west. And uh, they said that they would do this if Microsoft didn't. So Microsoft did. And so then the PC game consortium kind of folded their tents and quit. And that same year started PCGA, PC Gaming uh, Association. Where's Matt? Anybody? The former president of that is here. <clears throat> He's all the way in the back. Stay back for a <laughs> But uh, anyway, so PCGA has now changed their name and they're now OGA, uh, uh, Open Gaming Alliance. But so that's that's the lineage of that. So that's the history of the, of the game conferences. Now there's probably, uh, no exaggeration, a dozen, and that's probably too conservative or more, game conferences going on around the world uh, all year long. There's a big one in Germany, a giant one in China, one in South America. They're, they're just all over the place. So it's, it's, it's popular. People are interested in games and they pay money for it. This is Laura Croft in 1996. And I don't know how many of you played this game. I played the hell out of this game. I was, just thought it was terrific at the time in 1996. And I was, I was satisfied with it until 2013 when I saw this. And here's Laura's hair moves. She's got facial features. I mean, just, the difference in image quality in that short period of time uh, is, is extraordinary. And that's the kind of trajectory that we're on. And that's what's getting people excited about games because that's Laura Croft on a high powered PC. Next year, you'll be able to have Laura Croft like that on your hand up device. So now I'll give you a real quick history of, uh, of, of computer graphics, which is what the engine is that creates this stuff. This material, by the way, a little personal plug here, comes out of a book I published last year. Uh, go to Amazon, look up my name, you'll find the book. You probably can't read that, because I can barely read it on the screen. But uh, you all will get a copy of the slides. I'll give you a URL at the end of the presentation for a copy of the slides. The, uh, the, what it mainly shows is how computers were evolved and then used in various uh, applications, including gaming. I have a better slide coming up in a minute. But here's the story that I want you to hear, because I think it's pretty fantastic. So we went from this, which was TV, to a boom that. And that was bad because we thought this was going to bring one of those to us. So then we built this, and that led to the foundation for this. 
Now that is 40 years of history in, in a few seconds. But basically the idea what happened was when the, when the Russians uh, exploded a nuclear weapon, it just scared the Jesus out of everybody who wasn't Russian. And uh, we were afraid that they were going to uh, bomb us. And the logical path for them to take would be to fly from Russia north over the Arctic Circle down through Canada and the United States. Well, obviously, the Canadians in the United States didn't think that was a great idea. So they built a thing called the Dew Line, which was a ring of radar stations right at the Arctic Circle. And they fed data from the Dew Line over telephone wires in the 50s. So that was the beginning of the internet down to a central station in Massachusetts where guys like this, like that, sat and monitored air traffic. That was the beginning of the air traffic control system. All that happened in the 50s. So uh, these guys, and he's holding a light pen, and so what he would do is he would point the light pen at the screen. The light pen didn't emit light, it measured light. So he'd hold the screen, and the coordinates of the screen would then tell him that that spot was there, and that would give him coordinates of the plane, and then he'd do an IFF identification friend or foe of whether it was a commercial aircraft or a military aircraft, and it was military, then they got excited and they sent out planes and meet and so forth. And so this was the way they did it, and they had these bands of radar uh, doing it, all feeding data over the phone lines to Massachusetts. That is a graphics terminal, 1954. So that's where it all kind of started. And uh, once that came up, once that technology became developed, uh, people found other uses for it. And one of the other uses was games. And so we started using computers to play games on, and we've been doing it ever since. So you could almost say that games made the computer industry. You could almost say that. Anyway, so where we are now is we now have computers like this in our pocket that can play games, and, and damn well at that. And uh, some of you may have attended uh, NVIDIA's session last night. They announced their new um, Shield console. There's an example of, you know, not a giant processor, but a pretty good processor for games using Android. Uh, I don't know why that's in your choice. Because I'm a master of PowerPoint, that's why. Now, uh, one of the things we hear, however, with the evolution of semiconductors and the uh, performance that is being obtained is, well, don't you think that the handheld devices are going to catch up with either consoles or PCs or pick up whatever your, whatever your other favorite platform is? And the answer is no, there is no catch up. You never catch up. Moore's Law works for all platforms. What you'll also be hearing at this show is you'll be hearing the people who are making the small handheld devices and tablets and so forth saying things like console quality graphics. Now that's a marketing comment that's being said very easily and casually without any clarification. The clarification is you're talking about PS1 console, not PS4, and they're going to let you draw your own conclusion. Um, and you can interrupt if you want. <laughs> Uh, but the point is that uh, you can't play PS4 games on a handheld device this year. Now, you will be able to in a few years because you'll be playing this year's games in a few years on a handheld device. The thing that keeps Moore's Law from uh, giving us the benefit of its development is the game industry itself. And I contend that the game, game industry is moving too slowly and has moved too slowly for quite some time. With the introduction of Mantle by AMD, that spurred a couple of other organizations to provide better APIs. Apple did Metal, which is a better API. Cronus is announcing, can I say? Yeah. Cronus is announcing Vulkan, which is a super thin API like Mantle. It's got a lot of man Mantle in it. <clears throat> and Microsoft is announcing, as I mentioned, DirectX 12. Now, the good thing about DirectX 12 is it's going to be cross-platform. And that means that if you develop a game for a PC, it will also run, say, Microsoft, on uh, Xbox and maybe other platforms that are uh, compatible to that, which would be all of them because they're all using the same basic processor from AMD. The good news there is that reduces development cost because developers, game developers, used to have to port to four or five different platforms, and each port took time, took money, and delayed the introduction of new games across
across platforms. So that's going to change now. So it means their costs are going to go down, their development time is going to go down, and the net result is that the introduction and population of high performance games is going to go up. Not immediately, it's going to take a few years, there's a pipeline to build games, uh, it's going to take a few years, but it's going to be good as the population of games go up and as they take more advantage of the hardware, that attracts more consumers. And that's what's happening in the market. So we're predicting a very, very robust and aggressive growth in the gaming industry, which is fueled by <coughs> better APIs, faster processors, commonality, and more platforms. So having said that, this is the big picture, and those are the big numbers, $67 billion. $67 billion is more than the gross national product of Syria. It's more than the gross national product of 65 other countries. This is big, and this is just hardware. <clears throat> so this is the PC component of it. This comes from, these all come from our reports, by the way. It's one of the major ones. And um, by the way, that, this box is sitting in the back there. There's also one sitting under my desk. <laughs> um, the PC market uh, is broken up into four categories, and it gets confusing sometimes. And I'm not going to go into a lot of talk on this, but if you are confused by it, just send me an email. Like I say, answer all of them. It's basically desktop, laptop. Each one of those are split into integrated and discrete. And they all have different characteristics, different price points. And so it does get confusing. But when we count it all together, it's a whole lot of units and a whole lot of money. And with that, I think I'm going to share my No, OK. It's the software market. Now, we don't track the gaming software market. We track the stuff that makes the games, the content development software. So this is not our data. Uh, but this comes from OG data that I mentioned to you earlier. And they vet this data. So you be pretty comfortable that this is good stuff. Here's another 26 billion. So put 26 on top of nine of 67, and that's a lot, of, a lot of billions of dollars that the gaming market is. And with that, Tom Roy Tech. Thank you. Which is the page down, John? Uh, just a space bar. If you want to wander around, you've got to Okay. Well, we already saw this slide, but I'm going to go over a couple of the. Uh, the stimulating uh, factors for each of these slices, uh, starting with the PC. Do you want to point it to? Oh, that'd be great. It works. Um, the PC, yeah, which we define as desktops and, no, uh, and notebooks, um, lately, because of the advanced graphics in uh, discrete GPUs, is moving toward the power user. And part of that is a result of the low-end PC market uh, moving toward mobile devices and mobile use patterns. Uh, we're gonna see 4K uh, driving growth here. And the good news for the low-end is that the uh, Microsoft's efforts with the Windows 10 and trying to uh, make games across all platforms uh, may stimulate the lower end of the PC market for gaming. Consoles, uh, the traditional consoles are, are stable, they're growing slowly. Uh, there's some new categories in the console space, uh, Android consoles, uh, NVIDIA just uh, announced the uh, Shield console, and we're pretty bullish on that. We think there's so much development in Android and that the uh, chips are uh, getting so fast and that a large percentage of traditional console people don't need the triple A. They're happy with double A, they're happy with A or triple B if you use a bond rating system. <laughs> and so they're going to be moving toward, uh, toward Android consoles, I believe. Uh, another uh, question mark in the console space is um, Valve's efforts, which might stimulate uh, some console activity as well. Smartphones and tablets, amazing explosion onto the scene. Already 34% of the entire hardware market as we calculated. Uh, smartphones kind of reached a saturation point temporarily last year in gaming growth, but because of the phablets and because of better software, uh, they are starting to grow again. And the percentage of uh, 
of the purchase price that people uh, are willing to spend because of gaming is growing in smartphones. Tablets, very strong already in gaming, uh, both from a touch perspective and from things like NVIDIA is working on with uh, controller-based uh, gaming. Handhelds are, uh, handhelds are a market that took a big beating in the last three or four years, but there is a market, and it's a bit of a niche market. The traditional hand, handhelds from Sony uh, and Nintendo are um, starting to feel the effects brutally of, of mobile devices. However, there is a certain percentage of the gaming population that do not want touch controls. They do not want their fingers blocking the screen, and handhelds uh, are uh, a viable market for a, a fairly large niche, large niche, I would call it. Uh, Location-based gaming, John's kind of the expert on, on tracking that market. I think John's including, are you including a, a I, IGT and, and uh, slot uh, gambling machines in that? Gambling machines, not the uh, PC gaming halls in China. Right, so not uh, location-based is not internet cafes, but does include I, the, um, the fancy uh, slot machines you see in Vegas. And last but not least, peripherals, which is uh, a huge amount of money across all segments, whether it's PC or console. Okay, here's a slide that uh, covers the, uh, the peripheral PC gaming uh, market, and uh, it's, it's, it's huge. Uh, uh, gamers are buying a lot of mice, they're buying more expensive mice. Uh, sound systems are often overlooked as a component of uh, gaming hardware purchases, but uh, a lot of super high-end speaker systems are purchased with gaming intent. Uh, keyboards and wired wireless headsets, significant market size if you look at the growth rate and the total. Uh, then you have your dedicated gaming devices which are smaller but um, but but significant. Uh, personally, I think that this little slice right here, which is head tracking and motion tracking, uh, is um, an opportunity for growth that the VR uh, trend uh, will help. Because being able to look around in a game is a powerful experience, whether you're driving or flying, or you're looking over your shoulder at a, for the bad guy who's chasing you. And you can do that looking at a screen using your head as a pointing device. It doesn't have the same 360 movement as a VR headset, but you can get a lot more information. And uh, as John likes to say, the more you can see, the more you can do. Well, the more you can see, the more you can get killed less. <laughs> Make that Ted's law. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, traditional based console game market, uh, feeling effects of people, the casual customers moving to mobile. And it's a challenge for them. They are uh, doing great things to address it. And, uh, but it's, it's fairly slow growth and it's fairly mature right now. That could change. Traditional handheld gaming market, we talked about that briefly. Um, having a lot of uh, pain with the mobile devices and for people who previously bought handhelds because it was the only solution for mobile gaming, really. And the uh, uh, ability to use a controller in the handheld to keep your hands off the screen blocking pixels and having a, a kind of a more in-depth experience will keep this market as a pretty large niche. Two billion dollars is, is not nothing to turn your nose up at. Okay, new game hardware devices. This is what we consider the largest growth in the uh, handheld space. Starting off very small, but the CAGR massive. Uh, again, because of the built, I don't know, the, the, the total installed base of Android devices must be 700, 800 million. Two, two billion sold or users. Well, 
Oh, I guess salt because the user can have more than one phone. Yeah, so Tim might know that. Are you talking about the, just the number? The number of Android it's users in the world right now. It's probably about a billion, actually. Okay, so you have a billion people on this platform. A lot of them like to, uh, are hobbyists, they make games. Uh, a lot of them are professional game developers. It only makes sense that there's going to be massive development in Android. And uh, the touch-based gaming is, is significant, but it's limited. And for more core players, a handheld does make sense. So small market, high CAGR, a lot of uh, developers for this market. OK, Android consoles. This is one of my favorite um, subjects because I believe that Android consoles are going to shake up the gaming space. I believe that we are on the edge of what I would call a paradigm shift. And a paradigm shift, most of you know what it means. It's, it's a, a large change from the status quo. And again, this, this, the same stimulus I just spoke about with handhelds is going to affect this market where you have a billion people, thank you, using Android, and you already see some significantly large companies getting in the game. Uh, you have Amazon Fire TV. Uh, by the way, when we, unless a controller is sold, we don't count Fire TV as a console. So in our data, it's the combination that makes it a game console. Without the controller, we do not count Fire TV as a, uh, as a console. Uh, some small companies that, you know, were kind of pioneers. They, they didn't sell a ton of stuff, but they, they, they had the vision to, to get this going. Um, Google Android TV plus controller. We haven't seen a standardized controller yet for Google Android TV, but uh, if they came out with one branded Google, that would move the needle significantly. Uh, Mad Cats, Mojo. Uh, Pretty nice device. I think it's pictured here somewhere. Uh, maybe not. It was on the last slide. Uh, we, uh, as you all know, one of the most famous Kickstarter projects. Uh, Razer is coming out with one. The sh uh, Nvidia is really interesting because they have Shield Portable, which is a handheld, Shield Tablet plus controller, and Shield Console, all as what we consider Android consoles. And because the Shield Portable was designed with the ability to play on large screen TVs, it straddles the line between handheld and, and Android console. And uh, I've actually used the Shield Portable to play on my 55-inch uh, plasma, and it's a lot of fun, even though it's their lowest power device. Yep. And that's it. For you. For me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm doing Quick wrap, just a little bit more, and then we'll let you go. But no, we won't let you go because we want to give you stuff. <clears throat> um, to, uh, to the point about handhelds, and here we're talking about mobile devices, which are tablets and phones. And this is just some data that shows how much time people actually spend playing games uh, using, using their mobile devices. And every time I see these numbers, and these numbers come from a variety of organizations, uh, I'm always surprised at the, at the size of the game players. Now, mind you, this is every kind of game, right? So this is uh, what, whatever kind of first-person shooting you might be able to do on a, on a handheld, uh, all the way down to the roll and scroll, and click and point type games. So that's and then here it is on uh, other mobile devices. So it's just it just really is big, and I don't know. Maybe test yourself. Do you ever play games on a, on a phone or a tablet, or have you ever seen by doing it? Uh, probably. Short answer. So uh, how do you measure that market? It's difficult because uh, you can't say that a person bought a phone just to play games. Of course, they wouldn't do that. But uh, we've come up with a model which we think uh, applies a percentage. So what is the motivation in buying a phone that is partially due to game playing? So if you go down a list of checkoff points for an average buyer, First thing you're going to want is, you know, well, can I make phone calls? Second is probably, can I take pictures? Third is, can I get on the web? Fourth or fifth is, can I play games? 
And so doing that, we take a percentage of that to come up with this number. So you can challenge this number, cut it in half, it's still gigantic. And the same modeling and the same uh, proposition uh, is on the, on the tablets as well. So that's the way we arrive at those numbers. Can I just add one thing to that? Uh, those percentages are based on global mobile device sales, not just first world, where the percentages are much higher. Yeah, yeah without belaboring the point, we have a very sophisticated model that arrives at that number, which has to do with buying power, buying influence of people, buying these things. Tell them I'm busy. <laughs> and so here's just some more stuff about people who are buying games and, and, and why they're doing it. And so arcades now. I don't know if any of you ever played in arcades or not. Uh, I did, and, and uh, a lot of my friends did. A funny thing happened in the Bay Area and in other parts of the United States in the 1980s is that arcade games were becoming very, very popular, and that frightened people. And it frightened them to the point that we actually have laws on the books right now that prohibit arcade machines, believe it or not. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm used by this comment that was made at the time that arcade games were being outlawed. And uh, I, think it, I think it's very poignant that, you know, of all the problems we have, arcade games are the biggest thing to worry about. Well, the interesting thing is they've come back. And even though they're outlawed in Alameda County, for example, there are some big arcade parlors, and they <clears throat> do that by calling themselves home inter not home entertainment, family entertainment centers. And so by being called family entertainment centers, they now can get around it. If you go to these places, they are packed. I mean, they're jam-packed with people, a lot of kids, but it's kids with their family, believe it or not. Uh, and there's food there, and there's even, some of them have uh, movies. It's what it used to be that an arcade game might get parked in the lobby of the theater. Now it's that the theater gets parked in the back room of an arcade uh, center. Uh, it also includes the uh, pachinko places in Japan, which, uh, have you ever been to one of those? My God. People sit in those, some of the, those machines all day long and all night long. It's one of the noisiest experiences you'll ever have. And then uh, the uh, machines that are, of course, in, in Las Vegas and places like that. These are all gaming machines. They're playing games. And then there's another thing which we don't know quite how to categorize, which is Twitch, which is people watching people play games. But there's almost a billion dollar uh, piece of business right there of, of, of uh, voyeurs. And so on. Well, the so what is that the gaming market is huge. As I mentioned to you, it's bigger than Siri. It's, it's 67 just in hardware and another, uh, another 26 in software. We're, we have new platforms that have been introduced to the, to the gaming industry. They are going to bring in new users. They're going to make gaming more accessible and accessible uh, by more and more people. And that will have a spillover effect. Uh, if you recall on one of the earlier slides, the first pie chart slide we had, with the uh, show you all the platform. One of the comments made there is that these are not either or situations. The person doesn't buy a game console or a PC or a handheld. They typically buy all those things. So it's not that one thing is going to kill another. Um, by bringing in new platforms, they, we automatically bring in people who will then want to move to another platform once they start to learn the pleasures of gaming. So visualize that someone buys a Android console gaming thing. Let's say it's an Amazon Fire thing. They're playing this and going, well, gee, this isn't bad. I wonder what it would be like on a bigger machine. You get a bigger machine. And, and we've seen that phenomena happen in market after market after market. So it's going to continue to happen here, which means we have just a whole lot of growth ahead of us. <clears throat> and it's going to be fueled by Moore's Law and the uh, crossover capabilities of uh, APIs. I think that's it for me. Yeah, that's it for me. So um, I answer every email I get, uh, usually within 24 hours. And it was so hard to get that door to sit still for this. <laughs> uh, I don't, can you read that at the very top? That says www.johnpeddy.com slash GDC download. And that's where you can get these slides and a whole bunch of other stuff if you want it. And uh, he's Ted at JohnPenny.com. There's Kathleen at JohnPenny.com. She's the one who can tell you all about the software uh, development tools that are, that are behind it. I'm John, you know me. And so that's it. So where's Robert? Has <coughs> Robert left the building? Judy. Get Robert. <laughs> that's Judy at JohnPenny.com. <laughs> Thank you.
Have you guys done any looking at the new VR platform that just pulled into a developer since there's 20 of them? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, we're not ready to release data yet, uh, but we are building a model for it. Um, I, I'll just give you an idea. The model swings from 100,000 units to 6 million units. So it needs a little work. <laughs> it's the problem is the assumption. And uh, to that point, to that point, uh, uh, to that point about, about VR is that uh, if you look at the big headsets like Oculus and Sony and a few others are building, you can get one number for how big that market's going to be and how fast it's going to grow. If you include things like Samsung's gear, then the number goes up astronomically. And, and you, can, you can think about uh, going into a phone shop, any phone shop that sells a Samsung phone, and finding a gear headset there. That's, that's Samsung's dream. Well, if that happens, that's a lot of units. And so like I said, we're trying to come up and model that in a realistic way. Our, our um, models and our forecasts tend to be very conservative. We're not uh, a big number pusher in that sense. So uh, with that, uh, what can you Oh, I've got questions, sorry. I'm a professional speaker. <laughs> yes, sir. Are you considering augmented reality headsets part of the VR marketplace? No, that's separate. We have a, that's another report that we're working on, is the, is the augmented reality ones. Um, the, I think I've identified 20 companies that are making AR devices. Uh, and there's probably more, I probably missed some. So that, that's going to be a very, very exciting market. I'm personally very excited about AR. I think that it's going to open up a whole bunch of new capabilities for us. Uh, you know, I, I, I love the classic models where you're wearing AR glasses. They have to be inconspicuous. Um, is Richard here? Richard Hannon? Yeah. So Richard's very proud of the fact that he had his eyes lasered. So he doesn't have to wear glasses anymore. But I bet you wear sunglasses, don't you? Actually, I don't. I switch, but... <laughs> <laughs> Ru ruined my setup, thanks. <laughs> well, anyway, almost everybody wears glasses of one type or another, prescription type or sunglasses. Uh, so the idea of wearing glasses is not that onerous. The problem is you don't want to look like a geek when you're wearing glasses. So if you wore glasses that had a screen that only you could see and only you knew you were looking at, wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you do that? Of course you would do that. So I think that's the model, is that you know, there'll probably be uh, OLED screens, which will be transparent, we can see through them. We can see them, getting the focal length right is going to be tricky, uh, and they'll have data on it that we'll be able to use in real time. And my favorite model is you walk up to a street sign in Tokyo and it says, you're lost. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the gaming application is, is more of uh, viable for VR. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, there's, there's some neat, fun games in VR, though. Yeah.